Good afternoon. I'm Pat Living with the Department of Health and Social Services and your moderator for the COVID-19 update for Wednesday, January 27th. We are joined today by the Minister of Community Services, the Honourable John Stryker, and the Yukon's Chief Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Brennan Hanley. Once again, our sign language interpreter, Mary Thiessen, and André Boursier from French Language Services Directorate are also joining us. Following our speakers, we will go to the phone lines for questions from reporters. We will call you by name, and you will each have two questions. Before we begin, I'd like to verify that everyone can hear us. If any of the reporters are having problems, please email ecoinfo at gov.yk.ca. Minister Stryker. Uh, thanks, Pat. Uh, and thank you, Yukoners, for joining us today. I'm pleased to be here with Dr. Hanley on the traditional territory of the Ta'an Quachin Council and the Kwanlun Dun First Nation. And I'm very happy to report that we continue to have no active cases of COVID-19 in the territory. This is great to see, and I want to thank all Yukoners for doing their part to keep our territory healthy and safe. While there are no active cases, we remain in the middle of the pandemic. News of new variants of the virus showing up in Canada are a clear reminder that this continues to be a dynamic situation and we must remain vigilant. Last week, we were reminded of the kind of selfish actions that put our communities at unnecessary risk. On January 21st, 2021, two individuals presented at Yukon's mobile COVID-19 vaccine clinic in Beaver Creek, Yukon. I think it was Team Togo. At the clinic, they presented out-of-territory health care cards. Following a tip, Yukon Civil Emergency Measures Act enforcement officials followed up and were able to confirm that the couple had violated our self-isolation requirements and were not abiding by the declarations they provided upon entry into the, into the territory. They were charged under SEMA with two charges each as a result of failure to self-isolate for 14 days upon entry into the territory and failure to behave in a manner consistent with the declaration provided upon entry into the territory. The RCMP were also immediately alerted to the situation. I have to say I'm outraged by this <clears throat> selfish behavior. All of us as Yukoners are outraged. I find it disturbing that people would choose uh, to, uh, to put fellow Canadians at risk in this manner. Reports allege these individuals were deceptive and violated emergency measures for their own advantage, which is completely unacceptable at any time, but especially during a public health crisis. Our current self-isolation requirements are in place to protect the health and safety of all Yukoners, and especially our communities. Anyone who violates the self-isolation requirements puts all Yukoners at risk, and we take these actions very seriously. We will continue to enforce the emergency measures under SEMA to keep our communities healthy and safe as we carry on our vaccine rollout across the Yukon. We've also made changes to our eligibility requirements at our vaccine clinics. If you live in the Yukon but don't have a health care card, for example, if you're a temporary worker, student, or recently relocated, you are eligible to be vaccinated in the Yukon, but will need to bring valid ID plus one of the following, a valid Yukon student card, proof of employment in the Yukon, or reasonable proof of Yukon resi residency, for example, a utility bill. If you have any concerns about meeting these requirements, please reach out so we can look into how to accommodate you. You can call 1-877-374-0425. I want to be very clear though, if you are a Canadian but do not live in the Yukon, you are not eligible to be vaccinated in the Yukon. You must be vaccinated in your home jurisdiction. The Yukon is a beautiful destination, and we look forward to welcoming visitors again when it is safe to do so. I've also spoken with and heard from many Yukoners who are angry about this situation. We share your feelings. 
Hugh Connors, let me tell you this. We are doing everything possible under our Yukon laws to hold these people accountable. The RCMP are also working on this matter. Being in a state of emergency is what makes it possible to require people to self-isolate, to sign declarations, and comply with public safety measures. Without the state of emergency, the government does not have the authority to enforce these rules and restrict who can enter the Yukon. We all take this very seriously. We share in your outrage that people would do this and we strongly condemn this behavior. I want to thank all those in Beaver Creek and the Mobile Vaccine Clinic who were alert and took quick action to help us. Identify, sorry, who took quick action to help us identify this situation. And thanks to our SEMA enforcement team who found and charged these two individuals. And I also want to emphasize that all Yukoners are able to get the vaccine when it is their turn. Please don't miss this opportunity to get vaccinated. Thankfully, and to the credit of all those involved in the effort, the vaccine rollout is going really well. As of the end of day yesterday, we have immunized more than 5,170 individuals. I was in car cross yesterday at the clinic uh, as the clinic opened at Hashagun Hidi, the car cross learning center. Thanks to the many people who booked appointments, the clinic was also able to immunize more than 240 people yesterday. And the clinic is open again today. It was really wonderful to see everybody come out and I just, that was my first time seeing the mobile clinic at work and I just want to say to the teams that were there working, you're, you're doing a fantastic job. Everybody that I spoke to that came to get immunized yesterday praised the work that was going on there. Our other mobile team is in Dawson City this week. More than 300 Dawsonites got their shots yesterday. I know many folks lined up outside the clinic and braved the cold temperatures as they waited to get their shot. I want to thank Premier Silver, Deputy Chief of the Trondic Wichen, Simon Nagano, Dawson Mayor Wayne Potteroka, and great to hear you got a couple goals, Wayne, and Elders Peggy Corandy and Victor Henry for getting immunized. I'd also like to acknowledge Hashada Hen, Chief Linda Dixon, who got immunized yesterday in Carcross. It's great to see leaders across the territory taking their shot to help protect Yukoners. The clinic is open in Dawson for the rest of the week and this afternoon up until 6 o'clock for Carcross and Tagish. So make sure to book an appointment and get your shot. The vaccine is an important step in our fight against COVID-19. The vaccine will save lives here in the Yukon, across Canada and around the world, but we all need to do our part. Get your shot when the clinic is in your community. The mobile teams will be in Pelly Crossing later this week. Next week, they will be in Burwash Landing, Destruction Bay, Haynes Junction, Carmax, Faro, Ross River, Mayo, and Stewart Crossing. The clinic here in Whitehorse is now open to eligible adults over 65 years of age. Next week it will be open to those over 60. You can book your appointment online at yukon.ca or by calling 1-877-374-0425. Last week, we, will, we were able to immunize more than 1,930 Yukoners over 70 years of age. And a personal shout out to my mother-in-law, Frida, who went and got her shot. We've also rolled out the vaccine to 50 or so folks at the White Horse Emergency Shelter, as, as well as staff and inmates at the White Horse Correctional Center. We are really happy with the uptake we have seen so far, and we want to 
continue to encourage all eligible Yukoners to take their shot when it is your time. You do not want to miss this opportunity. You can find the full vaccine rollout schedule online at yukon.ca. I know there have been some concerns raised about the booking systems and our clinics. I want to assure you that while there will be kinks that come up, we have a team working tirelessly to address issues and keep the booking system working. I know Premier Silver has spoken about the importance of the booking system already and I know Dr. Hanley will offer some more detail as well. The most important thing is that the booking system is helping us to roll out the vaccine safely and effectively for all Yukoners. As I said, we are prioritizing those most at risk. Two weeks from today, the clinic will be open to all those age 18 and over in Whitehorse. I encourage everyone to remain patient and wait your turn. Everyone who wants to be immunized will get a chance in the coming weeks. We're in a very fortunate position here in the Territory and we are on track to immunize everyone who wants in the coming weeks well ahead of most other Canadians, uh, most other Canadian jurisdictions. Please keep that in perspective and be patient with the team that is rolling out the vaccine. Tell them thanks, by the way, when you go. This is a major public health initiative with many moving parts and many variables. I must give credit to Minister Frost and the team at Health and Social Services who are really driving this vaccination initiative. As I said, I went and saw the, the clinic in Carcross Tagish yesterday. I'll be going back this afternoon, and it really is a great job that they're doing. The rollout is designed to be flexible so we can adjust as necessary as we go. For example, opening up to those over 65 in Whitehorse is, is, is just such an example. The supply of vaccines is also a major factor. We are scheduled to receive our next shipment of vaccines next week. We will continue to roll out the vaccine as quickly as we can while prioritizing the health and safety of Yukoners. As we go forward, we will continue to provide updated information on yukon.ca and at these weekly updates. You can find accurate and detailed information about the vaccine online at yukon.ca. In closing, I want to acknowledge that our collective efforts to keep our territory healthy and safe are working well. A big thank you to all Yukoners for doing their part. Even so, our work is not over and we cannot let our guard down. The best thing that we can all do to prevent the virus from spreading and keeping ourselves safe is to practice the safe six. Wash your hands often. Maintain physical distancing. Stay at home if you're feeling sick. Travel responsibly and respectfully. Self-isolate as required and follow the gathering guidelines that are in place, including limiting indoor, indoor gatherings to 10 people. The plus one, of course, is to mask up in public. Do it to keep yourself safe, to keep your family and friends safe, and to keep the Yukon safe. In addition to the four SEMA charges I mentioned earlier in connection with the Beaver Creek incident, we issued two separate charges for failure to self-isolate in the last week. Any of these charges are disappointing and concerning. The self-isolation requirements are in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our territory. When you fail to self-isolate, you put your friends, your neighbours, your colleagues and your fellow Yukoners at risk. What we need to, to do is our part and work together to keep our fellow Yukoners safe. As you wait your turn to be immunized, please stay vigilant. We are not out of the woods yet. It is important to continue to practice the safe six and mask up. Minimizing the spread of COVID is especially important as we continue to roll out the vaccine across the Yukon. Thank you to all Yukoners for your ongoing efforts. Remember to be kind, patient, and respectful of one another. We're in this together, and together we'll get through this. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Stryker. Dr. Hanley? 
Thanks. Thanks, uh, Minister Stryker. Uh, good afternoon. Bonjour. Bon après-midi. As the Minister says, we continue to be free of active COVID cases. In fact, it is now over two weeks since we announced our last new case and a week since our most recent case recovered. It is good for all of us to have that breather while we focus our efforts on the vaccine campaign. But we know that even a brief look south or west of here reminds us that COVID risk is still very much present. We were talking in my team yesterday about the Groundhog Day effect. I mean the movie, not the actual day, which is coming soon, actually. On Monday, Canada somberly noted the first anniversary since having a confirmed case in this country, and thus began Canada's challenging journey through this pandemic. Towards the end of 2020, we all definitely felt ready for a new year, the return of light, a fresh start, the arrival of vaccine. So it is with some disappointment that we have to consider that 2021 is bringing us some new challenges. While in some ways we may feel like Bill Murray starting a day all over again, we should consider how much better a place we are in, no matter what is ahead of us. This is a virus that we know so much more about. We have experience. We can test for it. We know what public measures, what public health measures work. And perhaps most exciting of all, we have a vaccine. So this is a plea to hang in there. Let us continue to get the most out of our favorable position, our wonderful winter and the returning light. Let's focus for now on getting through the rest of this winter and landing into spring with a well-vaccinated population and when we will have a better sense of what measures we can begin to adjust. With winter blues, the beginning of vaccination, and just plain pandemic fatigue, it can be easy to let down our guard, to ease personal restrictions and take on more risks. Maybe it's something as simple as hugging a friend or taking off a mask when we talk to a neighbor or even shaking someone's hand. All those rituals that we need and that we naturally yearn for, but not yet, and it may be a while until we can. As the days cool off, we will be spending more time inside, and it is inside, particularly when close to others, not from our bubble, that we can be more susceptible to COVID-19 infection. There is no need at this point to do any more or any less than we are currently doing. We just need to keep doing it well. We will get to a better place with vaccine, but we need to get there first. And we are off to a good start. As Minister Stryker said, we have immunized over 5,000 Yukoners in seven communities, including long-term care residents in Whitehorse and Dawson. And between this week and next, we will be covering, covering all the rest of the communities. Last week, Team Balto and Togo completed their first trips to Watson Lake, Beaver Creek, and Old Crow. This week, we'll continue to administer vaccines to residents of Teslin and Dawson City and Pelly Crossing and Car Cross Tagish. We have recently opened up appointments to 65 plus in Whitehorse, and those 60 and over can book this week for appointments next week. And what a great day we had yesterday, over 300 in Dawson, lineups in the cold notwithstanding, 240 in Car Cross, and a successful campaign at the Whitehorse Emergency Shelter, as well as people coming to the Convention Center. I'm very pleased with the progress of the campaign so far. And if people step up, we will see the numbers mount rapidly. I know it can be frustrating for people when they feel we could be running more people through, but we are managing these initial weeks very carefully for reasons I have previously explained. Our focus is on older Yukoners, those in long-term care, and in covering vulnerable populations living in group settings, and in getting out and around to all our communities. That means a lot of vaccinators out and about all around Yukon 
while detailed training of more vaccinators is still going on. These multiple activities mean less hands on deck at the White Horse Clinic until we ready up for the public clinics, where we will then be prepared to crank through as many people as our supplies allow. Soon we will be starting second doses as well. So we are basically starting whole groups of people over while others are getting their first shots. You can only imagine the complexities of getting so many different teams and supply chains in place, all the while attempting to minimize wastage of doses. So once again, I echo the minister with my thanks and appreciation to both the clinical teams of vaccinators and their supports, and to the logistical teams doing all the moving around of vaccines, IT support, mobile freezers, transport, and other supplies. This is a massive operation. And thanks to the silent majority of you out there for your patience as you wait your turn or make your booking. Yes, we all know there have been glitches in booking. While it has been challenging at times to recognize and correct those glitches, the use of the booking system has helped tremendously with clinic flow and our ability to effectively plan for the right amount of vaccine and the right number of immunizers on site to ensure a smooth thoroughfare of individuals receiving their vaccinations. You may notice that there's a wide range of appointment availability for the cohorts that, we're taking, that, that are taking bookings for now. And we hope this availability promotes accessibility pro by providing choice and the opportunity for people to come when they're available to do so. A quick reminder on the use of the booking system, when, when entering your healthcare number, please enter the digits only without dashes or spaces. And despite what you may have read in the news, it is important and very helpful when individuals book appointments in advance. While the clinic does have limited capacity for walk-ins, individuals are preferred to make an appointment. It is this information that dictates how much vaccine we make available. Remember how we need to plan every vial and every dose, not just because of Moderna's storage requirements, but because we are actively managing inventory while awaiting incoming supplies. In what may seem quite random to some, this rollout has been meticulously planned. And in light of these initial supply limitations, groups eligible to receive vaccine have been prioritized for specific reasons. While recognizing all the other important people and important reasons to vaccinate, Age is the biggest risk factor for serious and fatal COVID disease. This is why we have designed the clinics, starting with long-term care residents, the staff who care for them and others living in congregate settings, then moving to those 70 years and older, while also covering our higher risk healthcare workers. These populations are at the highest risk of contracting the virus based on age, living accommodations, and the frequency of interaction with COVID-19 patients. Vaccine release is based on the number of individuals in Yukon within an age group. So we reserve vaccine for those in that age group until we are ready to open up to the next age group. As Minister said, the current age group is 65 years and up, and next week will be 60 years and up with the general public clinics after that. And just a point, there are up to 10 appointments available for each time slot. So when visiting the booking site, you may see multiple spots available. That just means there could be one or many appointments left at any particular time. When all appointments at that time are booked, then the time is deleted. So with us now past the 5,000 mark, we are seeing those vials start to move. We are on track to see that by April, we will have provided second shots to every eligible Yukon adult who wanted one. As planned, the three territories are already far ahead of the provinces. With some people's rush to find holes in the system, or glitches, or screenshots of a multiplicity of appointments, we need to slow down a bit and reflect on how privileged we are. There are many, many Canadians who will be unable to receive vaccination until the late months of the summer and early days of the fall. A little more time, a little more patience, 
and we will get there. And we are doing this well. With skilled vaccinators, live data entry to track vaccine doses, the ability to track for adverse effects, and the capacity to stick to second dose schedules. Yesterday, I took a little time out at day's end for a ski. I hit the freshly groomed trails in the evening and watched the pink and blue sunset over snowy mountains as the nearly full moon rose into sight. I could not help but feel awe once again at what a beautiful place we are in and grateful. We're in a place with no active COVID cases, with the territory relatively free of restrictions, and with already almost one-sixth of our target population reached for first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination. We are in a good place, and the fact that we remain on track to be one of the first jurisdictions in Canada to vaccinate most of their adult population is quite the success within itself. So please wait your turn and allow the teams to do their work in the way that was planned. Our plan has also been created to waste as little vaccine as possible. We're vaccinating on schedule based on our population and resources. And once we do open to the general public, we will see doses in Whitehorse administered at a higher rate than what we're seeing right now. Now, one dose, of course, one dose per person will not achieve herd immunity. We have allocated enough doses so individuals who have received their first dose can receive their second dose on schedule between 28 days and not more than 42. If someone does not receive their second dose, the vaccine will not be as effective. We need to remember that herd immunity, if we get there, will take time to achieve. It is not going to be immediate. We need, again, to be patient and considerate of those who have already received the first dose, who will need their second dose fairly shortly after. Already by next week, we will begin administering the second dose to long-term care home residents and staff. By being patient and waiting your turn, you're helping us to reach that goal of getting Yukon vaccinated in as rapid a manner as possible. As we make our way through this exciting era of vaccine, we can still face illnesses of any kind and are still susceptible to case importations and even outbreaks. Canada's cases remain high, even if more stable, in most provinces. So the risk of importation remains significant. So please remember that respiratory symptoms could mean COVID. Let me stress again how important it is to seek testing if you have symptoms. Our job as a whole population is to be alert for symptoms. Even mild symptoms should be taken seriously. If you do have symptoms, you should seek testing at the COVID testing assessment center or at your rural health center. Always stay home and self-isolate when you are symptomatic and when you are awaiting your test result. Coming out of a pandemic is a long and grueling process. This ongoing cycle of news Revised public health measures and economic turbulence have left Yukoners with doubts and concerns. The question was even raised here last week. If we get vaccinated and nothing changes in our public health measures, then what's the point? Well, the point is it gets us closer to where we need to be so that things can change. We do know that that vaccine is a crucial ingredient to getting out of this pandemic. We may not have all the steps in place yet, and the order and the timing. But without a vaccinated population, it will be much more difficult to make changes. As we move further down the path of vaccination, we will learn more week by week about what to expect and what might be possible. We will learn more about how long the vaccine lasts, how effective it is against variant strains of COVID whether and at what intervals boosters may be required, and how well the vaccine prevents or limits asymptomatic disease and transmission of COVID. Meanwhile, we will continue to watch the progress of the current wave of COVID activity in Canada. 
and continue to reinforce and revise our protections so that we can live as well as possible while limiting the ability of COVID to enter and circulate in Yukon. Not everything in this journey has been certain, and a common theme I have come back to is how often we have had to make decisions in the face of uncertain evidence. But we do know a lot more about this disease, and we can be very confident that this vaccine is safe and the most effective way, ultimately, to combat COVID-19. While many people are excited for this turn, for their turn, it is also normal that others have trepidation towards COVID-19 immunization. <clears throat> the vaccine was developed at astounding speed, but without any skip steps in development, clinical trials, or the regulatory processes that led to this vaccine being approved. If only all vaccines could be developed at this speed and with so much global investment and cooperation. There is plenty of inaccurate or plain bad information out there, and some of it is circulating locally. If misinformation gets the better of us, we will have a hard time seeing ourselves through this pandemic. A high uptake of vaccine, on the other hand, means we get to keep COVID to a dull and livable menace rather than a daily threat to our lives and our livelihoods. If we don't take action in achieving immunity, there is no telling when we will be able to relieve some of our public health measures in place. If you are feeling unsure about receiving your vaccines, please take the time to research trusted sources and find answers to your questions. You can email or call the COVID info line, visit yukon.ca. So if you're hesitant or reluctant about getting your vaccine, please take a moment to visit critical, credible sources. And most adult Yukoners are only little more than a week away from booking their way into vaccine clinics. And Whitehorse will be able to begin booking a time slot for immunization beginning a week prior to February 10th. As Minister Stryker said, always remember the safe six plus one, using your mask and using all those six measures in your daily lives. This is our best way to protect ourselves from COVID-19. That's all for my update. Thank you. Masicho. Remember to take care of each other. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you both. We'll now go to the reporters and we'll begin with Haley, Yukon News. Um, thank you for the update. Um, my first question, uh, sorry, my first question involves the um, couple again from Beaver Creek from last week. Um, I know I heard there that uh, the government and the RCMP are working as hard as they can um, to kind of determine what can be done. I'm wondering at this point if you have ideas about um, what options there are beyond the fine of $500 per charge. Um, thanks for the question, Haley. Well, obviously the one other thing that is there is uh, uh, compelling uh, those two individuals to attend court, which is also there uh, now. Uh, so that's the only update that I have. Um, so we, uh, uh, as, as I said during my opening remarks, we've We've done all that we can, or the most that we can under the act uh, to make sure that uh, we're trying to address this situation. So uh, the fines are there, but also uh, uh, the, the, uh, what, what is also there is that they, uh, uh, once they are served, they will be uh, required to uh, attend court. Thank you. Um, second question was for Dr. Hanley, and um, I'm looking sort of to clarify um, some rumors that are floating in the community. When it comes to the people who have been vaccinated so far in Whitehorse, I have, um, you know, it's open to age 65 plus now, the correctional center and the shelter. Have there been other um, environments other than frontline healthcare workers who have been immunized, such as hotels or businesses? Sorry, uh, other than healthcare workers, I wasn't quite sure what uh, are you talking about. Yes, sorry. So beyond age 65 plus, yeah. the correctional center, the shelter, and healthcare workers, are there other groups that have been immunized in Whitehorse? 
No. So uh, we've been uh, focusing on those groups, the groups that I outlined in, in my notes. Um, the uh, we haven't been. Um, including sectors uh, such as you know some of the essential worker categories um, th that you mentioned because we are able to include all all of those including people with um, underlying medical conditions um, in in that kind of one big category uh, with the public clinics because that's going to be our most efficient way to take care of those people thank you thank you we'll move now to john ckrw Hello. I'm wondering, uh, as the vaccine rollout continues in the territory, what is our shipment uh, of vaccines supposed to look like? There have been supply issues across the country, and I'm wondering if we're still on task to receive as many uh, vaccines as we're supposed to. And I'm also curious as to when the last vaccine shipment was. Yeah, thanks for that question. So, so the vaccine supply issues have been all around the Pfizer product um, and not around the Moderna product. So, so just we, we have no uh, no signals or indication that um, that the Moderna supplies uh, will not come in as scheduled. We do have uh, February dates. We do not have March dates confirmed for for delivery yet. Um, and I believe the uh, February date is around the 7th or 8th of uh, February. Um, the last shipment came in, uh, I think, the third week of January, I, I think. Yeah. yeah. The third week. The beginning of the third week of January. So, so, so far we have been uh, maintaining um, that schedule and we have no indication to expect at this point any supply disruptions. Minister Stryker, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I just will add, John, that the um, the whole of the vaccine rollout and how we prioritize long-term care facilities, frontline healthcare workers, uh, our our elders, uh, and our communities was all based on this supply. And so we watch it closely. We are uh, uh, as we're confident of the confident of the next delivery date that that allows us to keep moving and and so we're always sort of watching ahead a few steps. If we uh, have any reason for concern, that gives us the ability to adjust. So far, so good, and uh, and it's why we've been able to uh, move up even with uh, uh, adding the category of 65 plus and and things like that. So so that gives you a sense that that we're still feeling that that things are well on track. Thank you, John. Do you have a follow up? I do. Thank you very much. I'm interested in uh, knowing what exactly does herd immunity look like here in the territory? Is there a set number that we're going to, uh, I guess, use as the benchmark? And once we achieve said uh, benchmark, what will happen with COVID-19 restrictions that are currently in place? Will it be relative to other jurisdictions or will there be some form of uh, easing of restrictions? Yeah, these are these are good questions, and 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 to be honest, they're questions that we're all uh, trying to figure out as we go. And so, um, herd immunity, for example, is is one of those things that we 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 have the, the, this target figure of seventy five percent. Now, now that to be clear, the seventy five percent allocation is really based on anticipated uptake, um, and that's a, that's a kind of a national figure. So that's the the, the first kind of cut, as it were, of, of vaccine is anticipating 75% uptake. But that roughly also corresponds with, with what we think is going to be the amount needed to achieve the so-called herd immunity. And, and herd immunity really means enough people in the community or the territory are immunized to prevent circulation of the virus. Uh, that doesn't mean the virus will be completely eliminated. It means it would not really have enough grip on on enough susceptible people to effectively circulate in the population. So the estimates are that we think that's around 70%, but that is a figure that could change again as we learn more, uh, as we get more study, um, study data, and as we get more of this sort of real world um, information and data on the actual effectiveness of vaccine in COVID active areas. 
Um, so, so yes, of course, then that is going to influence how confident we can, we will be able to be um, on our ability to uh, to look at all the public health measures. So even right now, we're looking at what are all the public health measures we have in place, and if we're thinking of a theme of emerging from the pandemic. What is the influence on vaccine on on the ability to um, to to lighten or to change or alter public health measures, and then that will all be part of the advice that we will then bring forward for uh, for a government through through my team. We're already working though with with government with multiple departments to anticipate what what might what might happen. Um, clearly, this depends not just on Yukon but on the rest of Canada. So so clearly, there are many many factors at play here, including the role of variants, what will likely be the emerging and increasing role of variants, and how that influences COVID activity and the state of pandemic um, yeah, as we move towards the spring. It depends on our actual uptake versus our anticipated uptake. It depends on the increasing evidence that we get, not just about how much uh, proportion of the population needs to be immunized, but the effect, as I as I mentioned, the effect of the vaccine on the ability to limit transmission and asymptomatic infection. So all of that is information that we expect to have more available as as we go forward. So hopefully that gives you kind of a a picture of what we're looking forward to. Thank you, John. We'll move now to Philippe, CBC. Yes, thank you. A question for Dr. Hanley. What is your latest recommendation when it comes to people who are pregnant or breastfeeding? Are they encouraged to get the vaccine? So this is uh, this is one of those areas where we really want to make sure that the uh, the the woman has an informed consent. So that means that that a conversation takes place, so that the the person and and their family realize that um, the the information the specific information from trial data is is lacking uh, because a pregnant and breastfeeding women were excluded from the trials. So so really what we use in that conversation is a lot of information that we have based on what we would expect to see and what other vaccine, vaccines, uh, the, his, the whole history of vaccination and pregnancy has told us. So in part of the, the writing that I did um, to prepare some uh, some notes and some background information for healthcare providers really tries to put this all in, into perspective. I would say that the data and the experience is very reassuring um, for the safety of these vaccines in pregnancy and breastfeeding. But all of that in a context that we do not have that specific trial information to to say uh, w what the actual um, outcomes are. So it really goes back to that informed um, conversation with a health care provider so, uh, so that uh, the woman feels confident with the right information to make the choice that is best suited for her. Thank you. Follow up, Philippe? Uh, yes, on a different topic. Uh, we've seen in Germany the recommendation for masks has changed to uh, asking people to wear N95s or antiviral masks. Do you expect we'll see any change uh, in terms of what's recommended for mask use? Always difficult to know uh, how far to project, but I would I would say that um, the use of masks in in healthcare settings is really very different uh, from uh, from the recommendations that generally come in the uh, in in the public and and for members of the public. Um, the uh, uh, I, I think it's it's quite a complex conversation. It's it's quite cumbersome and quite difficult to wear an N95 um, all day. Um, and we, when we're really looking for what's the goal of um, a, you, you know use in the public, it's uh, primarily to limit that that transmission with fairly simple barrier methods. You know, we know that the three layer mask is is preferable. It provides more of a filtering effect, but the main effect is really Really helping to limit a droplet transmission um, between between people, especially when that that two meter distance is um, is uh, uh, violated, as it were. So. Um, 
the all of these these are, are also contingent on what's going on in in terms of the COVID activity. And if you're looking for, say, one more potential tool, that that might be something that would, that would be on the table when you have high activity, despite all of the other the measures that that we know works. So I, I would say. I feel that would be an unlikely to be a, a useful and practical additional measure. It would be interesting to see what the what the German experience is, but um, we know we kind of know what works. Um, and, and again, I'd go back go back to the basics, go back to the things that we know work really well, that we have shown to work here, combine that with really good contact tracing capacity, which we have here, um, keeping people aware of testing and the, the need to test and testing capacity. We kind of know what the package is. I, I think that uh, it, will, it, it will get us through, and now we have vaccine to add on to that. Thank you. We'll move now to Tim Whitehorse Star. Yes, hello. Uh, my first question is uh, regarding uh, that couple from BC in Beaver Creek. Um, do we have any idea whether uh, they were tested for COVID or not? And should the people that were in contact with them, such as the local pilot who chartered them to Beaver Creek, should uh, they and their contacts be tested? I think you, yeah. Yeah, I'll be happy to take that one. Thanks. Um, so wh what... Um what we uh, what we did through um, uh, my team uh, the on the communicable disease side is do a very we did a very detailed uh, risk assessment to determine whether there had been any uh, any uh, credible exposure um, to either uh, team members or community members the pilot um, and that that involves it's it's the same process that we use when we're doing contact tracing so when we have a known case in the community and we're looking for did contact occur and whether that's within a healthcare setting, within a family and a household, within a public setting, the same kind of types of questions. What we're looking for is was uh, distance, uh, w w w were there protocols in place? Were there sanitation protocols? Was mask use uh, used? Uh, did the people themselves have have masks um, within the within the flight? Were protocols maintained? Was, was there any possible breach of of protocol? And so, going through all of those, we determined that. Uh, and and I must say, this is all premised on the people being uh, positive. So we, we we take kind of take that ex assumption, even though you could say the random risk of someone from BC being being infectious is is based on based on active cases in BC is roughly one in a thousand. So we know that the, the sort of the random risk is already low, but we make that assumption. Okay, what if they were positive? Would there have been an exposure? And having reviewed all that information, we were very confident that, uh, that, there, was no, uh, that there was no exposure. So there was no test uh, done. Uh, of course, normally, uh, normally someone who is in self-isolation is not tested unless symptoms occur. Um, so there, there was no indication for testing. And of course, as, as, as is obvious, there was no control over what these people did anyway. Um, but, we, but we made the assumption, you know, as if a, a test was done and if it were positive, would there have been an exposure? And uh, we were very confident that, uh, that there was not an exposure in any, in any of these scenarios. Do you have a follow-up, Tim? Yes, uh, my second question, I want to change uh, topics a little bit. Uh, a, frequently question, or a frequent question we're getting here at the paper is, why aren't the, uh, or why isn't the clinic in Whitehorse open on the weekends if we're trying to move this uh, vaccination process along? Uh, the most common comment is, well, the hospitals don't close down on the weekend, why is the clinic? Yeah, so the the, uh, the the clinics will be running uh, six days a week, um, and uh, you know, like anything, it's uh, we're going for an end game here. So we're we're going for a, a, an intense vaccination period over uh, basically a four month period of time. So that's um, that's pretty intense. We need our staff to uh, to rotate um, and to be and to be rested, and we can do it. I mean, we're, we're seeing. 
seeing that, again, the numbers are ramping up, we're on target, we're getting to where we need to be, um, and uh, doing this in a, in a methodical way. I think it's also an opportunity when you have when you have a down day, especially in a large center, it's a time to kind of reset, to recalibrate, to debrief, to clean, uh, to ensure that you know everything is in place. So, so I really, I, I think in terms of quality and uh, and overall efficiency, having a down day at, uh, built into the schedule um, is a is a really good idea. We, I, I think, it's really important to reflect that. We have been, uh, there have been a lot of staff working in this uh, sector for a year now. And, uh, and, and we're looking at, um, as I say, a long and potentially grueling uh, process ahead of us. So preservation of staff, allowing people to have uh, downtime and rest time and family time, th these, are, these are all UConners uh, doing their part. And, and everyone needs and needs a break, and and so having always lim work realizing that we're we're always working with limited numbers of people, uh, we we need to schedule in that ability uh, for for reset and recalibrate. Thank you, Minister Stryker. Yeah, I'll add a little bit of a story. When when I when the pandemic first started here in the territory, uh, Dermot O'Donovan, the person who's heading up our emergency response, he explained to me that you want to set up systems that work smoothly, because if you do them smoothly, then they'll flow better over time. And yesterday, when I went to the uh, the clinic, the vaccine clinic in Carcross, I saw that at work. So. First of all, it's not just one person doing the vaccination. They had set up five stations. And then also, they they had adjusted because normally people are booking for themselves in one slot. But what they understood was that often a household would come and you might have two or three people that were coming for the vaccination. So quickly, the teams had figured out to add an extra chair that if, if, if it was a household coming, well, we'll do those two or three at the same time. And things... That, that increased the throughput, and, but it was smooth. And they, uh, in Carcross, uh, one of the community nurses had been sort of uh, assigned as a greeter because she knows many of the community folks and she can help to uh, orient people. But after a time when things started to slow down a bit, she, at, at the at the front end, she ended up helping as well to vaccinate. So it ended up with six. And I saw uh, the clinical lead checking around to make sure that each one of those people over the five or six hours, there's, even though that doesn't seem like a long time, there's, there's a lot of focus that's required. And, and everybody got a break. And those breaks rotated through. So what I saw was that it ran very smoothly. And I think that that's part of the overall design in time. So yeah, you can add a day, but of course, you know, it's not that there's one person in in the clinic here. There's there's lots of people doing that vaccination. So we just want it to happen. And to Dr. Hanley's point, between each uh, uh, vaccination or each household that came to the table where the vaccination was taking place. There was someone cleaning right then and there after each person. And as in, they're in a waiting area, and when they get up, someone else comes and cleans. And after they get their vaccination, they go back and they have to, to a waiting area on the way out to spend 15 minutes. And as they get up, someone is there and they clean in behind. And it all works uh, like, like it felt like clockwork. So I think that those things, just to give people a sense of what's going on or what they'll experience when they go to one of the clinics. Thank you. We'll move now to Claudiane, Radio-Canada. Oui, possible de me dire en français ce qui a changé dans les procédures suite à l'incident à Beaver Creek pour les gens qui voudraient obtenir le vaccin avec une carte de l'extérieur du Yukon. So, could you please uh, tell us what change and the protocols that are in place given the incident that happened in Beaver Creek and what uh, what uh, new documents will be necessary to be able to get vaccinated? Do you want me to... Je vais essayer... Il y a quelque chose qui ont... 
ont changé. Um, premièrement, c'est uh, uh, quelqu'un qui vient de la communauté uh, et qui uh, greet, uh, I don't know, but uh, dit bonjour à tout le monde quand ils arrivent uh, et qui peut uh, uh, donner une question si quelqu'un est euh, inconnu, par exemple. La deuxième chose, c'est un autre euh, moyen pour, euh, pour dé déterminer si quelqu'un euh, 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 vit ici au Yukon ou non. Par exemple, une carte euh, d'étudiant ou euh, euh, quelque chose, euh, une, une lettre qui vient d'un de, de, de emploi euh, euh, ou euh, un papier qui dit quelqu'un habite à, à une place au, au Yukon, à une communauté euh, ici. Um, quelque chose. Et si, si quelqu'un a une carte d'hôpital qui vient d'une autre province, par exemple, qui, qui, peut, qui peut affirmer que les gens euh, résident ici au Yukon. Est-ce que ça marche? Bravo. <rire> Merci. Ça fait, ça fait bien. Uh, Avez-vous une autre question, Claudienne? Docteur Henley, vous avez euh, toujours confiance qu'on va pouvoir atteindre euh, le niveau de vaccination euh, dans les temps euh, que vous, vous êtes fixé. So, Dr. Henley, you're still uh, confident that we will be able to achieve the level of vaccination uh, within the time frame that we have, uh, that, that you have set in the beginning of this process? Oui, euh, si tu continues avec euh, le fournissement de vaccins euh, sur le, su, euh, su, euh, selon le calendrier qu'on attend, si ça continue et euh, si les gens euh, continuent d'accepter le, le, le vaccin, euh, donc euh, oui, j'ai confiance que on est, euh, on a déjà, à mon avis, on a, on a déjà démontré que on a les moyens en place, on a la capacité du, du faire euh, le programme de vaccination et, 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 et ben, je suis très content avec ça et euh, je suis confiant qu'on peut continuer dans la même, euh, le même sentier. Pat, can I just add something, oui. please? Yeah, Mr. Stryker. Um, uh, I'm just going to back up to the last question from Claudiane. And what was asked of me was just to repeat what we had said earlier about how we'll add uh, something in place. Well, it's health and social services. The, the vaccination team came up with some new uh, ways in which to uh, ensure that people are here resident in the Yukon uh, when they go to the clinic. I'll also add something more because Yesterday, I talked with one of the clinical leaders. We also had a conversation with uh, First Nations across the territory to talk about the situation. We really have been working hard to make these clinics accessible for those Yukoners who want to get vaccinated. Um, and, and we want everybody in the community to get vaccinated. So we want to work with you. So we don't want to we know that the two people that came from outside the Yukon and and claimed that they were living and working in the territory has sent a real jitter through the system. And we will do our best to uh, uh, to make sure that, that that never happens again. But at the same time, what we don't want to do is to make this difficult for Yukoners to come. So if you are here and you're resident here, and I won't name names, but I did talk to a reporter uh, the, the earlier this week who uh, uh, had, had moved to the territory but lives here, and that person still has an out-of-territory health card, no problem. 
We will find the way. We're just trying to make this work smoothly. So, so uh, what I saw from the team there uh, at the clinic was that they would work to find a way. We, we do need to have confidence that you are a Yukoner and, and are, or are resident here, but as soon as we're able to determine that working with you, we will then get you that vaccine. So please, this, we don't want this to be uh, a, a thing that dissuades anybody from coming for their vaccine if they wish to have it. Thank you. On va maintenant passer à Marine Roborel. Pas de question, merci. Merci, Marine. We'll move to Marcella, News 1130. Thank you very much for taking my questions. Um, Minister Stryker, I was hoping to ask you if Rod and Ekaterina Baker have in any way tried to reach out to apologize or indicate that they plan to try to make amends for what they did in your territory. You know, Marcella, I have no indication that they have, but I, and, and I am staying in touch with White River First Nation, and so are our teams. I've not heard of that. Um, uh, so I, I can't I can't provide you any information about that, um, and and I will say that uh, after uh, the incident, you know I've been asked a lot of questions about this couple. Like uh, our team has just put its focus back on how to keep the community safe. That's our main job, and so. Uh, uh, I've made no overture towards them, I, uh, uh, personally, uh, or, or any of our, our team, uh, and, and I'm unaware whether they have made any attempt to uh, reach back into the community. Um, if they do wish to, uh, if they uh, reach us, we will find, uh, uh, we will give them that contact information, happy to do so. Thank you. Do you have a second question, Marcella? I do. I was hoping to ask you as well, Minister, what message do you hope it sends to everyone in Canada to hear that British Columbia will not let this couple get their second dose in time to ensure that they are fully immunized? Well, you know, I thought the, the message that, that uh, Dr. Henry gave before that was more the message that uh, I think she said something about that she felt that these folks should be ashamed. <clears throat> They had, sorry. <clears throat> I think, you know, ju we're just upset at, at what they did. And I think that they put a community at risk for their own. It was a selfish thing that they did. And, and it, was, it was appalling. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that we don't want all Canadians to be safe. We do, it doesn't mean that we don't want them to get a vaccine. Um, but, but we're trying so hard to to keep our community safe, to keep, to keep the territories safe. And every jurisdiction, whether you're from BC, everybody is working to keep uh, people safe. So there's a lot of, like, you know, there's a lot of hard work that goes into that. So shout out to everybody who's doing that work and to all the Canadians who are doing their job to keep the community safe. I just, like, we need to get past, <coughs> pardon me, we need to get past thinking about ourselves and thinking about others so that we, we begin to think about others. It's, it's, I think it's more important that we think about uh, everybody, um, not just ourselves. Thanks. Thank you. We'll move now to Lorraine, Radio-Canada. Oui, bonjour. Euh, je vais poser ma question en français. Euh, je voulais savoir, euh, les territoires, pour l'instant, euh, au niveau du calendrier de vaccination, on voit que toutes les personnes vont être, euh, toutes les personnes qui le veulent vont être vaccinées assez rapidement. Je me demandais quand ça, ce sera fait au niveau du Yukon, euh, des TNO et du Nunavut. Est-ce que vous prévoyez de recréer une sorte de bulle comme ça avait été le cas euh, au début de la pandémie ou est-ce que c'est un peu trop tôt pour parler de ça so given that uh, the vaccination is going well in the uh, three territories and that we are on the right time frame to be able to vaccinate everybody, uh, do you entertain the idea of going back through the territories bubble that existed uh, some months ago? Mm. Well, I th it, let me just start and then I, it'll be Dr. Hanley. So listen, the way this works for us. Oh. Uh, 
c'est euh, euh, nous attendons une recommandation par euh, le, le médecin comment on dit les jeunesses de santé chef. en chef oui. santé en chef mais on, on attend pour euh, une recommandation euh, euh, là-bas Premièrement, et après, ça, c'est une décision de le gouvernement. Mais, mais c'est pour Dr. Hanley. <rire> oui, mais tout à fait, c'est une décision gouvernementale. Euh, et euh, c'est, on peut dire peut-être que c'est, oui, c'est une considération. Euh, on a... Um, euh, on, a, on a beaucoup de possibilités. Euh, la première chose, c'est d'arriver à, à une population euh, où on peut être conf, confiant que c'est vacciné. Donc, on a atteint le, le, le but d'être vacciné suffisamment comme population d'avoir une, une protection communautaire. Et à ce point-là, on, on peut peut-être voir... Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'il y a, qu'est-ce qu'il y a la situation ailleurs au Canada et quelles sont les possibilités pour les frontières, pour les frontières peut-être euh, entre nous ou non, mais aussi euh, les autres frontières et ça dépend, ça dépend sûrement sur l'activité du Covid dans, dans les provinces, euh, dans, dans les territoires et euh, donc, il y a beaucoup à, à jouer euh, dans, euh, pendant les mois à venir et on a, on a déjà en, en train de planifier ou de penser toutes les possibilités et qu'est-ce qu'il faut pour chaque, euh, chaque route, chaque possibilité. Donc, euh, pour le moment, c'est trop, 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 trop à dire, mais certainement, c'est une idée pour explorer. Une question In English, please. Yes, if you could please repeat, repeat the response in English. So, yes, it's a question. It's a, it's a really good question, and it's, a, it's an idea that is uh, worth exploring. And there are a number of um, a number of areas that we are already beginning to explore. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot at play here, of course, and it goes it goes back to the previous question of you know when when can we lift uh, public health measures and and clearly we are working to eventually make recommendations in that regard, but so much depends not only on on the vaccine, so the so the the knowledge of the vaccine, but also the uptake of the vaccine and whether we will get to that that goal of herd immunity, community immunity, and protection. Um, But then also what's happening in the, in the rest of the, not just in the three territories, but in the rest of Canada. You know, what is the state of COVID activity? Have we gotten through the winter? Are we at a, a reasonable state? What is the role of the variants? And then putting that all together into what does that mean for all of our public health measures, including the border measures. Of course, it's also a national conversation. Interprovincial borders are very much a national conversation right now. And whether there should be any reinforcement, let alone And, um, international borders. So there is a lot at play. It's a it's a really interesting idea. Of course, uh, it, it would be very interesting to get there again. But there's still a lot uh, a lot that we need to know before we can get there. Thank you. Have you no question, Lauren? Uh, non, je vous remercie. Merci. And we'll move to Laura, Canadian Press. And we have lost Laura. Okay. So I would like to thank everyone for their time today. The next COVID-19 up, COVID update will take place on Thursday, February 4th at 9.30 a.m. This is a change. So again, Thursday, February 4th at 9.30 a.m.